Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Garver, and I'm really delighted that uh, my dear friend Yvonne Vargas asked me to talk to you today about my work on ecological law. I uh, have just really valued my time getting to know uh, Yvonne and working with him within the leadership for the Ecozoic uh, project that he's probably told you about. And I'm delighted that he is now teaching at York and um, so pleased that I'm able to talk to you today. I understand you've read a little about my lock-in, lock-out assessment, so I'm not going to focus so much on that, uh, but that's something you might want to think about as uh, as you listen to this lecture. And I hope to join you uh, at the end for a little bit, at the end of a class that I also teach on Monday afternoons. So what I want to do today is talk to you about how I'm uh, Use, uh, using this idea of ecological law in connection with a new framework for a lot of the work that I'm doing and that we're doing at Leadership uh, for Ecozoic and that uh, actually Yvonne and I are collaborating around territories of life and sacrifice zones. So what I want to talk about today, first of all, I wanted to set the context, our ecological crisis. I don't think this is probably news uh, to any of you, but I'll explain how the idea of ecological law emerged from that. Uh, then the importance, I think, of acknowledging historical pathways to how we got to this crisis. Then a little about my understanding of territories of life and sacrifice zones. Then how territories of life can be used as a frame for a long-term vision for ecological law. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with some concluding thoughts. So for the ecological crisis, going to focus a little on planetary boundaries as uh, one indicator of ecological limits, uh, the growth conundrum that we face, um, and then plurality and territories life in the context of core features of ecological law. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with the planetary boundaries idea. As it turns out, I started my studies in, in law to get a master's of law and a PhD in geography in 2009, right at the time uh, when the first planetary boundaries uh, paper uh, came out. And I was taken by this idea that planetary boundaries could serve as the basis for novel and adaptive governance approaches at global, regional, and local scales. So the question that brought me into my graduate studies was actually I had studied ecological economics, uh, started to learn about that. And, and a question uh, that perplexed me was, well, what is to law what ecological economics uh, is to economics? So the planetary boundaries idea and that question kind of merged at the very beginning uh, of my studies. Now, and here's another way of looking at these trends. Uh, when I first saw these graphs, I said, finally, uh, something that shows uh, the correlation of socioeconomic trends. So population growth, growth in GDP, growth in things like foreign direct investment, fertilizer consumption. There are many different graphs that you can put on the orange side or left side of this, and they all look pretty much the same. They have these exponential upward curves. And lo and behold, on the, on, on the right-hand side, the Earth system trends the shape of the curves is very similar. The amount of carbon side in the atmosphere, other greenhouse gases, depletion of the strat stratospheric ozone, uh, other indicators of climate change, surface temperature, ocean, ocean acidification, other uh, indicators of biodiversity loss, um, nutrient loading into land and aquatic systems. So th this is another set of indicators showing that how we metabolize material and energy is creating uh, uh, a global ecological uh, crisis. So based on this information, I, uh, I came to the conclusion that we're really dealing with these two mutually exclusive narratives. And one is the growth insistent and dominant narrative. This is uh, something that you'll see pretty much in any communique of the G20 when they meet annually. All of the official United Nations documents, including the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, conventional like economists, eco-modernists, and so on, are uh, follow the narrative that economic growth is absolutely necessary, both to provide for people, and it, it can also generate the wealth we'll need to solve 
all of our environmental problems. So growth, which causes uh, this ecological crisis, is also where the solution is. And you know, I and many other people are troubled by that narrative and are, are, are more inclined to a limits and system narrative. So this is the narrative of ecological economics, degrowth, uh, planetary boundary research, and so on. So these are exclusive, mutually exclusive. You can't be both growth insistent and insistent on not having growth. So they're in dynamic tensions. This is a place where we can think of different goals for humanity instead of uh, infinite growth, something like a mutually enhancing human earth relationship, an idea that comes from Thomas Berry of giving primacy to ecological limits, which means that they have to be respected in all areas of the economy and of law, of new ways to think about fairness and, and justice, interhuman, interspecies, and intergenerational fairness. This is the tension out of which ideas of ecological economics, degrowth, and ecological law are emerging. Uh, now, when we talk about putting beacons of hope on the horizon, uh, one that I want to keep in view and and then more and more uh, putting at the center of the view frame uh, on the horizon is this idea of a world made up of territories uh, of life. So I'll just recap these uh, core features of ecological law that I developed and you saw in the article you read. First of all, humans as part of earth systems, uh, life systems not are not separate from them. This is a... Um, a challenge to anthropocentric uh, uh, framings of law. Uh, they're a challenge to the, the Baconian, Descartian idea of, of humans and the human mind being um, a separate entity from all matter. Uh, so that uh, sets up a duality that ecological law would challenge. And you're probably learning a lot from uh, Professor Vargas uh, and, and along a similar vein. The primacy of ecological boundaries over socioeconomic spheres. So if you give ecological boundaries primacy, that has huge implications from law. So some people talk, in fact, I, I, I actually helped to edit a book that was called From Environmental Law to Ecological Law. In fact, if you give primacy to ecological boundaries, you really have to transform all law, not just environmental law. This is something that I try to, to really remind folks of when I'm talking about ecological law. This is not a replacement of environmental law. It's a replacement of our entire contemporary system of law, just to make it a little more challenging, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, that means full integration of ecological limits in all kinds of rules and policy, not just environmental law. Given the current status of things, those graphs I showed you, it means focusing uh, in the near term on reducing material and energy throughput. Um, we're still uh, quite far from figuring out how to do that. Uh, um, we'll get to that, uh, a little more on that in a bit. Use of biocapacity and extracted materials based on real need, not on utilitarian desires such as market price. For this one, my best example is gold. Whether or not Gold is mined um, because that can be an expensive uh, prospect. Uh, it's really driven by the price of gold, um, not by any real need for gold, since 70 to 80 percent of what gold is used for is either for speculation, um, a, 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 a store of value that you can uh, buy now and then cash in for more later later on. So a secure um, uh, an investment prospect. I've seen ads on Canadian television that just drive me crazy in that regard. And then jewelry and other kinds of luxuries. So a big question to ask, what if we made a, a bigger effort on what is truly needed for humans um, to live good lives? A plurality of diverse place-based approaches, um, but global. And this is really the principle of, of subsidiarity, which means that uh, we, we should try to have long governance systems uh, operating at the at the level that's closest to the communities that are affected, but acknowledge that for some challenges like climate change and other global environmental um, issues, the lowest level at which you can achieve uh, 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 results 
or um, an adequate response is the global level. So subsidiarity is sometimes cast as always being local. That's not what it means. Um, but in, in in an ideal future, the, what we're really talking about in ecological law, at least I am and others are, is a plurality of diverse place-based approaches. The territories of life idea um, uh, is, is is very much related to that. So keep that in mind as I talk more about territories of life. Binding and supranational rules is needed. Well, uh, many within this these critical legal approaches would actually uh, question um, the future of, uh, of of states, uh, at least states that have the kind of power that they have now and their complicity with um, with, with capitalist enterprises. Um, but uh, you need some level of rules uh, consistent with the, the the principle of subsidiarity um, that can be above uh, nations, be above uh, local the local level. Fair sharing among present and future generations of life. This is an idea of called uh, ecological justice. I'll say more about that in a minute. And it really, all of this implies a different kind of research and monitoring and, and knowledge structure, the kinds of things that we want to know about uh, what we're researching and monitoring would be uh, quite different. It uh, calls for uh, another principle in ecological laws. It calls for precaution about crossing ecological boundaries like the planetary boundaries. And then these ideas of, of ecological law being adaptive uh, and regenerative. Um, yeah. Now, my my friend and, and colleague, uh, Carla Spert, has come up with an... Uh, a tool that she calls the lens of ecological law, by which she looks at existing law against these three principles of ecological law. That is. So ecocentrism, recognizing and respecting the value of all beings and the interconnectedness among them, equitably promoting the interests of human and non-human members of the earth community, ecological primacies, uh, things like uh, planetary boundaries, respecting them so that social and economic behavior and systems uh, do not exceed them. And then ecological justice, again, is ensuring equitable access to the earth-sustaining capacity for present and future generations of all life, not just humans. Um, <clears throat> this is just a chart that really recaptures a lot of these um, ideas. So looking at different features of, of an economic or, or legal system, um, really from a, from a systems-based uh, uh, approach, um, how they're treated under contemporary law, including environmental law, and how ecological law uh, would treat them differently. This is a running list. I have uh, kind of a explosion of ideas. So um, maybe you'll get this uh, PowerPoint uh, to look at uh, and 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 study with a little more in a little more depth. But I've I've come up with these these ideas that align more with this idea of growth insistence and and contrast them to um, principles or ideals that would align with a regenerative economy, with ecological law, uh, and, and and so on. So the second thing I wanted to talk about is how is acknowledging historical pathways. So uh, being mindful of the co-evolution of colonialism and capitalism, uh, especially in the last five hundred years, and how these translate into contemporary uh, problems. And also the intractability of utilitarianism and the utilitarianism and the price mechanism as a surrogate uh, for need. So here are some core um, features of the dominant regime that law currently serves. So human exceptionalism, anthropocentrism. Again, I'm reinforcing some things that I said before. Strong commitment to infinite economic growth. Some would say even intractable. It is a huge, huge um, conundrum. State sovereignty, um, so it, so, but that's a problem because of how complicit states are in the global capitalist economy and what that means. I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Privatization and strong protection of private property rights. Well, this is really what uh, state sovereignty ends up state sovereignty ends up supporting. Monetization and commodification. Um, uh, as a way to deal with with harm, uh, with um, 
how we can protect nature. So this idea of putting a, a, a price on ecosystem services is highly problematic from eco an ecological law perspective. And then capitalism and the protection of corporations is, is, is another now globalized phenomenon that's, um, that's from the perspective of ecological loss, creating more problems than it's solving. Um, and in terms of territories of life, I guess the, the, the problem of remote ownership uh, that exists today is really uh, a legacy of this co-evolution of, of capitalism and colonialism. So I found this book, Patel and Moore's The History of the World and Seven Cheap Things, extremely helpful in understanding this co-evolution co of, of colonialism and capitalism. And this book starts with the story of uh, the island of Madeira uh, off of Portugal. Uh, that means the island of wood. It was discovered uh, in 1419 by Portuguese sailors. It was not um, inhabited or at least not permanently inhabited. Um, and so they went to work. Uh, this was a heavily forested island and they started deforesting it uh, to provide timber for shipbuilding. Um, and also they started to cultivate wheat. So they cleared land and then started growing wheat. Well, that um, uh, was then displaced over time with um, with sugar, which was becoming very pop popular uh, in Europe in the in the 1500s, so this now uh, required even more deforestation because you needed um, cleared land for the for the cane fields, but you also needed timber for the to fuel the the processing. Um, that then led to this the, the some of the first, I, I believe, the first um, uh, instances of African slavery. So. Um, uh, very big labor demands. Um, and because of the way that cane needs to be processed, uh, once it's cut, it has to be processed quickly or the, or the sugar won't be of the, of the desired quality. So the same slaves or workers that were cutting the cane could not also then stay up overnight or do, do the next step in the process. So this was also a prototype of the division of labor of factories and of uh, industrialization. And it was also a prototype of foreign financing. So a lot of this uh, was done through uh, the crowns, through monarchies. The Portuguese was a monarch, Portugal was a monarchy, uh, Spain also, um, England, all of the, uh, the, the European monarchy, monarchies got into the act here eventually. But uh, the financing was provided by these Flemish and Italian uh, financiers. What are they interested in? Um, the return. They want to invest, get a return, and then invest that money into something else. Does that sound familiar? That's called capitalism. So what happened in Madeira is that by the 1530s, there were no more trees. Um, so sugar production shifted elsewhere, primarily Brazil and the, the Caribbean. Uh, and then on Madeira, uh, there were new capitalist ventures. First of all, uh, wine and then became a, an important slave trading post. Um, uh, today, maybe there's still some wine um, being produced. Madeira is 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 a is a fortified wine named after the island, but tourism is also um, uh, an important part of the economy there um, today. So, what did this translate into today? Um, well, what was at play in uh, not maybe not so much in Madeira, but in other places, was the doctrines of discovery, doctrines uh, of reception. These were ways to impose in new places Western or European socioeconomic and legal system. So the doctrine of discovery was uh, um, enacted in large part through these papal bulls from the 15th century uh, that basically authorized the Spanish and Port Portuguese monarchies. They gave uh, uh, the, the Pope's sanction to go to these places, and if the people there weren't wouldn't accept Christianity, they could be slaved, enslaved, they could be killed, they could be treated very badly, and their land and their possessions uh, could be taken. The doctrine of reception is the idea um, that when the Europeans arrived in these new places, uh, they didn't recognize anything uh, that seemed like their law. So they treated 
those situations as places without any law, therefore their law had to be imported and, and, and imposed. Um, and it's not, it doesn't take a lot of thinking to see how that, um, how these Western socioeconomic and legal systems uh, have now been imposed in many places around the world and are the dominant kinds of socioeconomic and legal systems. They're the ones that are running um, uh, international uh, economic and legal regimes. So state and international legal systems over time adapted to support corporations, capitalism, and foreign investment. This idea of remote ownership and control. And this is the idea that, uh, well, it's, 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 it's the basis of, of land and resource grabbing. A lot of the um, investment that drives that um, is is managed through big banking centers like the New York City or or, or London and um, you know and, and and then those investment opportunities become accessible to people who are just trying to uh, save money or invest to provide for themselves in retirement uh, and so on. But the interest that people have in these investments is the return. It's that simple. Uh, there is no uh, concern. In fact, it's very hard to find out how those investments are actually going to um, affect uh, the remote people in places where these investments will, will hit the ground. Modern trade agreements sort of are a vehicle for all of, for all of this. They drive production to places with the lowest environmental and labor costs and increasingly include protections for foreign investors uh, who are given the right to sue state governments if they believe their investments have been badly treated. Um, so the end result is that ecosystems, people, and livelihoods are sacrificed to the greater good defined by growth and capitalism. I'll just give you a, a flavor of, of how this works in, in Canada. So. Uh, I, I've been paying attention to the litigation over Canada's Impact Assessment uh, Act, and that was just recently held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, I'm not going to get into to, into the the mind numbing maze of legalities around how uh, the courts have divided up, and particularly the Supreme Court has divided up federal and provincial jurisdiction in, in the environment, uh, but. That is at the key, uh, at, at the heart of why the Supreme Court held that act unconstitutional. They said the federal government had overstepped its bounds. It was stepping into uh, projects. It was it was applying federal impact assessment to projects that were primarily approved under under provincial authorities. They can overlap. I, I'm I'm kind of quite in disagreement with the court's um, uh, decision. Uh, but what they're responding to is. Uh, for example, the, the the perspective of Alberta, and so the Alberta Court of Court of Appeals actually also held this law uh, unconstitutional. That decision was then appealed to the Supreme Court, and the, and the attitude that comes out when you read the majority opinion there, and I guess many things about Alberta is that Alberta owns the land and resources on its territory and has the right to allow their exploitation for sale in global markets, especially tar sands, sin fuels. Um, so this is a, a very, very strong adherence to private property rights uh, with the Alberta government, the provincial government being the, 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 the controller of uh, private property and resource expo ex exploitation. Well, they do have plenty to rely on in the Canadian constitution for that. The federal government is like, yeah, the provinces do have the right to develop their resources, but if impacts affect federal interests, as in the case with climate change, the federal government can stop projects in the public interest. This was the uh, the, the 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 reasoning that, um, in, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, went uh, too far. But they're pretty much still endorsing this very property uh, rights uh, orientation towards uh, land and resources within Canada. But you who <laughs> There's another group of people here, and they were there first. That would be the First Nations. And for them, the doctrines of discovery, the doctrines of reception, are still denying them the authority to apply their own legal predictions and practices with respect to land ecosystems and, and other than human life with which they have age-old re re relationships. So 
I would call Canada and uh, Alberta and the federal government to, to have an, an orientation that sees Canada as, as full of territories of exploitation for profit and royalties. And First Nations much more leaning towards seeing them as territories of life. So what are territories of life? Um, this term comes from something called the ICCA Consortium, which says that an ICCA or a territory of life um, exists where there's a close connection between the territory and its custodian indigenous people or a local community. So um, uh, many territories of life that have been recognized are, are, are those connected to indigenous people, but this definition also includes local communities. Uh, and then that custodian community makes decisions, has a, has, a, has a governing system, makes rules about the territory through a functioning a governance institution. Um, and that governance and management regime contributes not only to the conservation of the ecosystems that support uh, the people on the territory and other life, but also gives the community livelihoods uh, and, and well-being. In other words, it's a it's a governance system that provides uh, for enough without uh, too, taking too much. Um, the ICC consortium talks about defined, disrupted, and desired TOLs. Defined ones are ones that are still more or less functioning along uh, with this def in line with this definition. Disrupted is where that's no longer the case. And desired, which for me is kind of the most interesting category, is where we can start imagining territories that are disrupted or maybe never really operated well as territories of life, as territories um, of life. When I was starting to think about this idea, I, in, in addition to war, there's also this idea of sacrifice zones. And a sacrifice zone is a place where the physical and mental health and quality of life of human and other life is compromised in the name of ec economic development and progress, um, ultimately about profit making. So this is uh, the remote ownership uh, problem. Um, or it's 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 one aspect of the remote uh, ownership problem. Certainly, remote ownership, where the, the people in control or are, are, are owning an investment, um, it's a lot easier for them to to create a sacrifice zone far away, uh, where they where they really can ignore uh, what's happening. So, under ecological law, at least my framing, it poses the question: Can we imagine territories of life or restored places? Would this kind of a sacrifice zone no longer uh, exist? Um, and instead, sac uh, sacrifices are made uh, for other things. Um, now, it's useful to note that the root of the word sacrifice is, is the same as the root of sacred. So what a society, what uh, is accepted within an e economic or legal system as, as a sacrifice that's okay, um, depends on what you are holding sacred. Is it growth? Is it wealth accumulation? Um, certainly that seems to be the case in our current economic and legal system. So part of the social, uh, ethical, and, uh, and ideological innovations that are needed have to do with new approaches to the common good, new approaches to what's being held sacred. We can learn a lot from many in indigenous cultures and legal traditions in which things like the honorable harvest that I explained uh, before or respect and reciprocity, uh, gifting uh, ceremony and so on um, are, are, are used to make sacrifices um, in, in a respectful way. So you, you can see this with, with uh, examples of many indigenous uh, practices of, of hunting or harvesting where there is ceremony, there is a respect for lives that are being taken to support and, and permission sometimes asked um, when other life is taken to support uh, human life. Here's an example of a sacrifice zone that's happening uh, right now in Canada you might not know about. Um, this was a headline from June of this year. Federal minister, this would be uh, Jonathan Wilkerson, uh, the Minister for Natural Resources said uh, appeared to be open to sacrificing part of a of a marine refuge off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador for oil discovery. Now, at the same time that the UN Secretary General, the IPCC, and so on is saying we really can't afford to pursue any new oil uh, sources, Canada is plowing ahead. So, um, 
pretty soon, it seems, um, these oil fields off of Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia also wants to get into the act now, uh, are going to be the next um, place where Canada absurdly, tragically, um, unconscionably is making plans for a vast new um, oil uh, set of oil development. Here's what this looks like. Now, if you look on here, there's Newfoundland on, uh, on, on the left. Here's Newfoundland on the right. The orange here is this marine reserve. And these little green and red boxes are where the oil that's being uh, explored for off of Newfoundland um, and Labrador is located. You can see uh, the overlap. That's why um, Minister Wilkins has said, well, you find the oil, you know, that's going to be more important than protecting this marine refuge. And um, by the way, the impact assessment that is done, that was done to allow oil uh, exploration to proceed here completely ignores uh, downstream greenhouse gas emissions of what happens when the oil is burned. That is categorically the case in impact assessment um, uh, and, and assessment of climate impacts uh, under Canadian environmental uh, under environmental law. So federal government may be upset that their impact assessment law um, uh, was held unconstitutional, uh, but they've kicked um, themselves in the foot by not going as far as they could to consider downstream emissions, um, literally ignore them when they're approving uh, projects like this. And here's one that it's close to my heart because I live now uh, in Montreal. I grew up uh, down here um right around here uh so i, I sometimes like to think that I, I i changed countries but i but i stayed within the territory of the haudenosaunee confederacy um both where i began my life and where i live now and both are sites for of, of really good examples of sacrifice zones the kinzua dam was built in 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 in, uh, in pennsylvania in, around 1960 to provide uh flood protection and electricity uh, for the growth of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but flooded two thirds of the Seneca Reservation. The Supreme Court said that their uh, Treaty of Canandaigua that was signed in the late 18th century uh, and guaranteed them unimpaired use of their land uh, in perpetuity um, could be taken away by the power of eminent domain, domain of the government. Um, and then in, in near Montreal, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, created sacrifice zones in, in Ganawake and Akwesasne to um, uh, territories of importance to uh, the Ganyangahaga. So here's a vision that I would like to get, as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, on the horizon, a beacon to keep in view, even though it may seem far-fetched. Um, given our ecological crisis, I think we need to have these beacons and always in view as we consider what to do next. So shouldn't every place on earth be considered a territory of life? Not protecting 30% of land and oceans by 2030, but 100% as soon as possible. Because again, I don't really understand if something is protected, an area is protected, what that implies for all of the areas outside. Um, I think th they are up... Um, to being sacrifice zones in one way or the other. So yes, we should do this to ensure equal, equal, ecological justice and strong sustainability. But of course, it's very complicated in our modern world. And this is where you may be thinking about this lock in, lock it out uh, assessment framework that, that you read about. Because modernity is hardwired into global society. Modernity um, in, in one sense can be thought of as this, the living, um, version of this complex of colonialism and capitalism that co-evolved since this, the 15th century. 50% of Earth's people live in cities. How do we think of cities as territories of life? Um, people are migrating. So in terms of having attachment to place, there are many reasons that uh, people are, are migrating, uh, including um, for, uh, because of climate change. And for many, many reasons, uh, consumer society, um, 
uh, among other things, many people seem to have lost a full sense of belonging to or a connection to place. So um, the challenges are huge, but I invite us to keep that beacon of this long-term vision of the world entirely made of territories of life uh, on the horizon. And I think ecological law can be a way to envision and work towards Earth made up entirely of territories of life. So this idea has become um, uh, more and more a focus within the work I'm doing within the Leadership for the Ecozoic a project where I, I coordinate law and governance work. Um, we came up with this vision statement. Uh, Yvonne helped uh, with this. We envision a proliferation of law and governance systems and approaches that are increasingly aligned with the core concepts underpinning the Ecozoic, which is a future era that Thomas Berry um, imagines in his writings of, uh, of a mutually enhancing human-Earth relationship and territories of life with a view to significantly shaping societal trajectory. So the work we're doing at Alfari, one is we're engaging with um, with communities in various contexts on the kinds of law and legalities and governance systems that are needed to protect existing territories of life or to work towards desired territories of life, uh, taking into account all kinds of pressures and threats from external legal systems and legalities, some of the things that I raised in, in the lock in, uh, lockout analysis. So right now, um, some of the work we're doing is, is is looking at indigenous peoples, mostly indigenous peoples in, in North, Central, um, and South America. The thing that I'm most involved with lately is trying to consider how we would, uh, well, imagine uh, working towards territories of life in local watersheds here near Montreal. So the Chateaugay uh, River uh, heads its source in the Adirondacks and flows into through Quebec into the St. Lawrence near Montreal. In fact, I'm right at the Ganawake um, uh, reserve. And then uh, the Champlain Richelieu watershed has its source um, in the United States and Vermont, uh, like Champlain divides Vermont and New York, but it also flows through Quebec through the Richelieu River into the St. Lawrence. Both of those have um, indigenous presence. Um, uh, the Chateaugay watershed is aligned primarily with the, the Haudenosaunee, uh, as you saw, uh, and the Ganyangahaga. Um, whereas uh, to the east of the the the, the Richelieu River, it's and and going quite a bit uh, east. That would be um, the Western Abenaki. So uh, that's one set of work we're doing. And then I'm uh, managing these ecological law case studies, which are really designed to show how ecological um, uh, law would work in concrete contexts. And um, that could, for example, be used to show how you could establish territories of life. Uh, with an emphasis on places where globally dominant legal systems that align with growth capitalism and legacies of colonial, colonialism have damaged ecosystems and communities attached to them. Here's uh, the, the Chateaugay and Champlain watersheds. These are just regular political maps. It's useful in this work to recall that you can look at these territories from a lot of different perspectives. So these two maps are covering the exact same um, area. I don't if you don't know the native land uh, website. It's it's fun to, to to look around at. So you have um, again, uh, you see the divide then between the the Abenaki or Wabanaki uh, land on the on the on the on the right or to the east, and the Ganyangahaga or Haudenosaunee uh, land um, on the left or to the west. And here's another way to look at it: taking taking away all um, uh, Political or other or other boundaries, and and just looking at it um, uh, uh, as the earth. So the other uh, the the ecological law case studies uh, I mentioned. The methodology here is to take a situation. I'll should give you some examples in a second, and deconstruct them in terms of not only the environmental law that's governing or or or, or making the situation possible, but also other kinds of law getting to the idea that ecological law transforms all law, not just environmental law. So property law, labor law, trade law, and so on. And, and also local, nas regional, national, and global. Then conducting some kind of analysis. I think the preferred um, analysis would be Carla Sperrit's Lens of Ecological Law. That's why she created this tool, to see whether existing legal regimes are consistent to the, to the extent to which they're consistent or not with ecological law. And then a, and then the third step, which she doesn't necessarily do with the lens, 
what is done in the case studies is then reconstruct that situation in both transitional and long-term scenarios under regimes of ecological law. So we started doing some case studies in, in 2020, right, as COVID was getting going. So it's it's been kind of a, a slow process. We started with these um, different, uh, the, the, these five uh, studies. Um, the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, case study has sort of fallen off for a variety of reasons. We are still looking at this phosphate mine that was proposed in Anitopolis, uh, Brazil, in the Atlantic Forest, a really horrible place for a mine that creates huge risks to the local community, but is well tied to the global um, uh, tr trade and financial system. Restoring the River Ethiopia in Nigeria, the River Ethiopia uh, uh, flows near the Niger Delta, the area of Nigeria that was massively developed uh, for oil development since the 1950s with, with huge impacts on um, uh, well, social and environmental impacts. Biodiversity um, on the high seas, this is looking more at a, a legal regime, a treaty regime, and how that would look different under ecological law, and then how wildlife are treated in Vermont. Since uh, the project is now expanded, we have these 11 studies uh, that will be um, included in a book that uh, will come out um, in 2024. I want to say a little about um, uh, the rights of nature, uh, because these um, I and others have, have written them as um, as a potential, uh, at least transitional uh, concept. Uh, but, but but this slide uh, will give you an idea of some of the concerns that I have about right, rights of nature. Mainly that rights are still a very anthropocentric concept and maybe inescapably um, so. I also think it's really important to, to, to recall the context in which rights of nature are being developed. In Ecuador, uh, you have a top-down state-managed adoption of rights of nature in the constitution. So that gives rights of nature a very strong standing within um, throughout Ecuador. And there have been some really strong constitutional court cases that have protected the rights of nature to the point of stopping uh, some mineral mining in, 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 a, in a national forest and stopping some shrimp farms in uh, mangrove forests uh, along the coast. But these are quite vulnerable to political forces and the influence of extractivists. So a lawyer that I know that works on these is saying you can just almost see them uh, scheming ways to dilute these rights. And if they don't succeed in the court, um, there would be then a vulnerability to just change the constitution in ways that weaken them. Uh, the government in all the cases that in which rights of nature have been held, upheld by the constitutional court has opposed giving them that breadth. Uh, why? Because they have a built-in conflict. They're, they're, they're also they're the creator of these uh, rights in, the, in protector of the constitution, but they're also, they depend on the royalties of the projects that they can stop. The Fanganui River in New Zealand is a bottom-up place-based uh, model. It, it evolved uh, from the settlement of 130 years of treaty claims of, of, the, of the Maori. So this is maybe an example of the emergence of bottom-up commonalities. Um, the way that rights of nature are protected here is through a guardianship, which has a, a, a role for those colonialism harmed. In this case, there is one Maori representative and one representative of the New Zealand government that speak on behalf uh, of the river. For uh, th the New Zealand government, this is giving legal personhood to the river because that is how that, that idea of legal personhood is something that is understood within Western legal systems. For the Maori, Maori it's that key ideas from their worldview. Uh, we are the river, the river is us. The river, the river is one living being that flows from the mountains to the sea and so on, um, must be given special regard for every decision taken uh, uh, regarding use for the river. So um, it, it's a really interesting formula. And I guess one that I would see more aligned with territories of life framing. And just to show you, um, this is a huge uh, part of New Zealand that this new arrangement um, uh, is affecting. I'm, I, I need to go and, and find out how it's working out because the, the law 
uh, that put this arrangement into effect took uh, was adopted in 2017. So whether it's working or, or now may be something that uh, is clearer than it was back then. So when thinking about rights, you know, I I wrote a book chapter called Our Rights of Nature Radical uh, Enough for Ecological Law. And I just think it's useful to, whenever we're talking about ecosystem services, if we are thinking in, in a reciprocal way to also think about human services to ecosystems and maybe an ideal within territories of life is that those things are both in effect. And what if instead of focusing on rights of nature, it's giving personhood to nature and law and person here to here is, is aligns, you know, sort of the homo economicus, the, the sort of the rational consumers, uh, greedy little people that our dominant economics supposes that we are. So why would we want to give that kind of personhood to nature and law? Uh, what about trying to give naturehood to people in the law? And if that sounds weird to you, uh, be comforted by the fact that most lawyers wouldn't know what that means. And that just sort of um, is symptomatic of or emblematic of, of the problem that, that ecological law is trying to address. A quick word on some troubling counter narratives. And, you know, first is denialism. So it, it's pretty apparent how much money is going into denying climate change or saying it's not worth addressing because too much will be lost. We're not sure enough about it to, to, to make people lives, people's lives miserable. Uh, by imposing the constraints that would be necessary. So Eco-modernism, um, you can Google that and see uh, uh, the, the craziness that's involved there. It really doubles down on human nature dualism and growth. It says, no, we should not live with, in harmony with nature. We should become the humans that, uh, that Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes said we were. We are controllers and masters of, of, of nature. And so we should build cities with buildings that look like this um, and, and perfect our, our, our technological and technological uh, prowess. And at some point, things will work out ecologically. It relies on decoupling um, economic growth from ecological impact, but completely ignores Jevons paradox, the idea that the more efficient we become, um, the more we use things that then create new problems or more of the old problems, completely throws caution to the wind. Don't even think of um, a precautionary principle here. It doesn't exist. There's simply a blind faith in human ingenuity. Uh, Bruno Latour wrote in an article, a reflection he wrote on this. To me, it sounds much like the news that an electronic cigarette is going to save a chain smoker from addiction. And then there's these sort of eco-modernism light. Uh, uh, growth insistence, sustainable development goals. Just look at goal eight. It, it calls for sustained economic growth. That's what sustainability means to um, uh, the UN and to world leaders and green growth, rampant greenwashing, you endorse, UN endorse broad institutional support. In closing thoughts, ecological law to me is about moving past harmful legacies of colonialism and capitalism. It's about reconfiguring true human needs. And it's about denormalizing a lot of modern habits of overproduction and overconsumption, including things like addressing rampant uh, advertising and messaging, uh, TikTok influencers and all the rest that are driving uh, overconsumption. The average Canadian uh, consumes, if everybody lived like a Canadian, we'd be using four to five Earth's worth of biocapacity per year. Embracing legal, plur legal, plurality, um, legal plurality and supporting life-enhancing place-based legal systems built around territories of life and a vision of mutually enhancing human uh, earth relationships is, is what um, ecological law is all about. This is about seeking these bottom up commonalities, not top down imposition of uniformity, applying the principle of subsidiarity so that levels of law and governance between or overarching local territories of life or places that have ecozoic legal systems respect their autonomy and are also life enhancing, but so that the, any level of governance that's above the local level still needs to respect those things. Then this would, um, at least in theory, work towards uh, result in work or require working towards regional and interregional systems of ecological law as a series of umbrella territories of life. So, um, or, or, or groupings, this is what Ostrom I think would call polycentric 
uh, institutions that reach uh, up to the global level. So um, a lot of um, ideal uh, idealization in there. Um, again, a, a beacon that might be far on the horizon, but one that I uh, always try to keep in view, and I invite you to do the same. And